Hi, and welcome to the third lecture of the Shakhtarishas Lecture Series. I hope you all enjoyed the first two lectures by Professor Alexis Anderson. As promised, he has produced a handout which can be downloaded from our Shakhtar Traditions website, and I've put a link to it down in the description of this video. This time, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Gavin Flood, who is a fellow at the British Academy. He's Professor of Hindu Studies and Comparative Religion at the Oxford University, Academic Director at the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies, and a Senior Research Fellow at Campion Hall. His publications include Religion and the Philosophy of Life, The Truth Within, the ascetic self and his widely used an introduction to Hinduism. Gavin has done important and groundbreaking work on such diverse topics as the ascetic self, the tantric body and hermeneutic phenomenology. And I can personally say that Gavin has been a huge inspiration within the field of Hindu studies and comparative religion. So without further ado, I'd like to pass on the word to you, Gavin. Thank you very much, Tanya, for that very generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to give this uh, presentation on theology and social change in Shakta traditions. During the period between the 7th and 11th centuries, a number of religious innovations occurred in Indic religions that we can refer anachronistically as, uh, to as Hinduism. In particular, during this period, we have the rise of tantric traditions traditions based on a new revelation of texts referring to themselves as Tantra and whose followers, the Tantrikas, either regarded themselves as transcending the older revelation of the Veda, whose followers, the Vaidikas, maintained cultural values that had been the bedrock of Brahminical society. This lecture then will examine this religious change, which occurred quite rapidly once it began and affected mainstream society and politics in ways that were a major concern to the orthodox Brahminical order, especially in Kashmir. I will make explicit reference to the Nature Tantra as my main source. Texts such as these mostly developed within the religion focused on the god Shiva, uh, and Alexis Sanderson, the most prominent scholar of these traditions, has called the period from about the 7th and the 13th centuries, the Shaiva age. Within this broad development, we also have the development of Shakta traditions, both as linked to Shaivism in what has become called the Shakta Shaiva traditions, and as an independent tradition, evidence for which has been presented by Veronika Olsen some years ago and by Alexis Sanderson in his discussion of the Kula Marga. Conversion to these new forms of Tantric Hinduism took place over a relatively short period of time within the history of Indic religions. The period from, from the 8th to the early 11th century. This period of about 200 years is about eight generations. While it might not be appropriate to call this sudden conversion it nevertheless falls within the paradigm of conversion if by that we mean a process of realignment over time rather than a sudden event. In this lecture I wish to use the period of the development of the Tantras with particular reference to the Nature Tantra as a case study of relatively rapid change in religious innovation in which beliefs of many people altered and how change impacted upon politics and society as a whole. Although the socio-economic paradigm has explanatory force, it is not the whole story and in specifying the constraints that led to the outcome of the shark to religion, we also need to take into account internal theological concerns. So the first part of my talk will, uh, is called um, the religious innovation frame. This is the frame within which I want to look at this change. So the general thrust of what I will call the religious innovation frame is the idea that there can be rapid religious revision that generates cultural and political reorientation. Um, theorists and field workers in plotting such change have mostly concentrated on Christianity in relation to modernity the way in which fundamentalism, for example, has impacted upon wider society. 
This idea of rapid social change has responded to ideas of religious continuity as development. For example, Marshall Salins, the anthropologist who has emphasized the more conservative nature of religion and its persistence. Within the context of medieval India, we see both continuity and change. The older sphere of Brahmanical values were coming to be replaced by new values embodied in the tantras, that sometimes regarded themselves as simply restating tradition, and sometimes saw themselves as challenging tradition and going beyond it. It is not that new religions found difficulty in the way that minorities might be that might find difficulty in living with the modern secular state, but rather the situation is more complex in that state patronage of religions was variable. And so although the medieval Indic state was not secular, it might be pluralist and support a variety of institutions. Sometimes new religions would not be supported by mainstream cultural values, in which case there might be a rupture or even a political and social exclusion of them. So both cultural forces of tradition and change are operative in the early medieval uh, period. So just to recap my, my slide here, you've got uh, the idea of, of what, what a tantra is. It's a new system based on this new revelation and there's a rapid spread of this religion, and it's adopted by kings in South and Southeast Asia, particularly as Alexis Sanders and Michoen, and there's a realignment over time rather than perhaps a sudden conversion. But nevertheless, it's quite quick over a period of, um, of, of uh, say, eight generations. And so this is the framework within which I wish to look at these traditions, a frame of rapid religious innovation. Um, and uh, within the context of conservative cultural values. So the origin of many tantras, including the nature tantra, is in Kashmir. The region of Kashmir, somewhat isolated from uh, the surrounding area by the mountains, um, was a region of great religious innovation over the centuries, being a center of Buddhist learning from the early centuries BC through to around the 11th century. The kings of Kashmir gave patronage to various religious groups who vied with each other for political favour. King Shankar Varman, who flourished um, and ruled 883 to 902, can be noted as a supporter of new religions to the consternation of conservative practitioners, the Brahmins. The cultural values of the Brahminical class can be summarised in the Sanskrit phrase Varanashrama Dharma, one's duty with regard to one's caste or place within the social hierarchy and according to the stage of life one is at, student, householder, hermit or renouncer. In Kashmir, the Brahmins were a powerful and influential lobby at the top of the status hierarchy, but not the group that wielded direct political power, which was the prerogative of the ruling class. The values embodied in the phrase Varna Shama Dharma had been developed through the long tradition that began with the revelation of the Veda and the scriptures of Hinduism. And with secondary revelation, the law books such as the Dharma Shastra or uh, and Manu, Manu Smriti is a good example here. And these books articulated traditional Brahmanical values of obedience to caste hierarchy. And indeed, a low caste person could not hear the Veda uh, and risk mutilation should he do so. Obedience to patriarchy, a woman has no freedom as a tantra, and she, as she is subject to the authority of father, husband, or son. And obedience to the king, who is the walking embodiment of the gods on earth. And it's the uh, duty of the king to punish, um, enact war on neighbors, and uh, protect the people. By the time of medieval Kashmir, orthodox Brahminism was not monolithic and within it were various philosophical positions such as the school of Vedic exegesis, Mimamsa, the monistic philosophy of Vedanta, as well as theistic traditions focused on the most prominent gods, namely Shiva, Vishnu and the goddess. 
The Brahminical religion of Shiva was based on texts known as the Shiva Dharma, as Alexis Sanderson has shown, that articulated norms of worship for lay devotees of Shiva, as well as royal patrons. Attracting royal patronage was particularly important for this tradition, and it seems to have been highly successful, guaranteeing a long period of time in enjoying the pleasures of Shiva uh, in Shiva's heaven before returning to the earth as a king. This orthodox Shaivism also followed texts regarded as secondary revelation called Puranas, the ancient stories of the gods and kings. The religion of Shiva therefore covered a wide social spectrum from orthodox worship of Shiva that completely aligned with Brahmanical social values, supported by royal patronage, to popular worship of Shiva, making offerings and performing worship, such as bowing to an image of Shiva, either in the an iconic form of the linga, a phallic representation of Shiva, or in an anthropomorphic icon, as Sanderson shows. In contrast to this lay religion of worship, along with its royal patronage, there were initiatory forms of the religion that were esoteric and not concerned with the sojourn in heaven, but rather with the complete salvation of the practitioner from the cycle of reincarnation, either in this life or at death. These forms of initiatory Shaivism that Professor Sanderson will be speaking about nevertheless did influence the mainstream society and in turn attracted royal patronage, even though the rituals advocated were to be performed in secret. But as Sanderson observes, what is important is that they had been performed for the benefit of the king and the celebrations such as military parades could be held to that effect in celebration that these rituals had be, been performed even though they were in secret. The benefits bestowed on the king were supernatural power that entailed the destruction of enemies, the warding off of obstructions such as interference by malevolent supernatural forces through appeasing them, the restoration of vitality, pushti, and, through, and the production of rain even. But although esoteric, it is these initiatory forms of religion that developed quickly and produced innovation in the religious landscape. Innovation that had an impact upon civil society and that became the concern of the orthodox who wished to maintain the social boundaries and promote adherence to orthodox religion and forms of worship. It's, so it's to these traditions that I, I will need to turn as an example of relatively rapid religious change. So by way of summary so far, you've got the Hindu state which, which controls social relationships and demands conformity to caste and stage of life where you are in the social hierarchy. But you've also got these new religions developing based on the tantras and the orthodox become alarmed by this new development. And King Shankaravarman in Kashmir is an example of a king who began to be attracted by these new forms of religion, but who was warned off, warned off them and indeed enacted certain prohibitions of them, as we'll see. So these, this new religion of the Tantra is a new revelation of Shiva and Shakti, the goddess. The goal is this liberation from the cycle of reincarnation and also supernatural power. And by supernatural power, that means the destruction, the magical destruction of enemies, which is very attractive for the king, prosperity of the kingdom, pushti, and protection of the king and his family. And we see this in the nature tantra. And how do you do this? You do this through magical ritual, through mantra, and you have to employ these new tantric practitioners to do this. So here's a diagrammatic representation of these traditions. You've got the Vedic tradition, which leads down to orthodox Brahmas and the, the, the revelation of the Veda. You've got the tantric, you've got the uh, tradition called the higher path, um, the Ati Marga, which is a monastic tradition which develops into the skull bearing ascetics, the Karpalikas. And then you've got the tantric traditions, the path of mantras, the Mantra Marga, and the path of the clan, the Kula Marga. 
And the path of mantras comprises orthodox shaivism, which generally, like the Shaiva Siddhanta, which is aligned to Vedic orthopraxy. And you've got transgressive Shaivism and transgressive Shakta traditions, the Shaiva Shakta traditions here, and also the purely Shakta traditions of the Kula Marga, the path of the clan. So this is, um, represents a scale of purity, if you like, from the orthodox Brahmanism on the left, which is highly um, regarded as um, regarded itself as as very pure and uh, a cut above the rest and the transgressive Shaivism on the other which consciously used impurity to transgress orthodoxy. So these tantras were often a dialogue between the um, goddess and the, and the um, and Shiva Although the earliest tantra, the Nishvasa Tattva Samhita, um, is quite early. It's dated by Alexis Sanders and Dominic Goodall to the fifth century. But there's a great proliferation of the tantric revelation occurs from around the seventh century to a culmination around the 11th. And these texts are, are a conversation, as I say, between the Shiva and the goddess. We can therefore read these texts as a sign of change. The evidence for this comes from a non-tantric source, Bhatta Jayanta's play about religious change in his society, which is the Agamadambara, which is translated um, by um, uh, Shabad Dezo, I think, called Much Ado About Religion. The evidence for this comes from a non-tantric source, um, sorry, the evidence for um, um, the orthodox concern about these new religions comes from this, this play written by Giant Abhata and other works as well. Now the story is very loose. It's a young Brahmin called uh, um, Sankarsana who visits different religious establishments, a Buddhist monastery, a Jain hermitage, and a group of Shaiva ascetics to discuss doctrine and practice. It's a humorous diatribe against these non-Vedic religions with the young Brahmin who is schooled in um, the traditions of Vedic exegesis, the Mimamsa, and who's just completed his studies, arguing his case against these other um, traditions, these senior monks and ascetics of these other traditions. The general conclusion is that these other traditions are flawed in their teachings, but perhaps more important than this, are hypocritical in advancing celibacy, vegetarianism, and teetotalism, while in fact indulging in wild parties. This play is written from the perspective of an orthodox Brahmin who is concerned about what he thought to be social degradation caused by the non-Brahmanical religion. The black blanket sect, the Nilambaras, in particular, attracted Jayanta's opprobrium. They were explicitly anti-Vedic and anti-Brahminical, singing songs, drinking, and performing sexual acts in public, simply wrapped in a black blanket. Oh, what asceticism, Jayanta dryly remarks. Their claim, according to Jayanta, is that the Brahmins are simply dominated by inhibition, Shankar and that this prevents them from realizing enlightenment, which is done through transcending orthodox social mores. In another of his texts, a work of philosophy called the Bokeh of Logic, the Nyaya Manjari, he thinks that this new revelation could be legitimate, but if it threatens social mores, it should be, it would not, it couldn't be genuine. And such texts, and the groups that support them should be banned. In this philosophical work, Jayanta tells us that King Shankar Raman banned the black blanket sect, or the black clad sect, and that he should also ban other groups, especially Shaiva ascetics, um, uh, such as the Kapalikas. But in the, in the play, I think, if I remember rightly, the Kapalikas are not banned and um, because there's a certain degree of conformity to orthodox norms by them. 
But Alexis Sanderson, in one of his um, publications, gives an account of the black blankets in, in the south of India. There was, um, Boja Deva was a Shaiva theologian and a king in South India, uh, whose daughter said she's going to join the black blankets. I'm going to join the black blankets, dad. And he says, well, yes, dear. Why don't you invite them for tea? So they come round to the palace, 49 couples, and he has all the men executed and the women banished. Um, an example of protecting your daughter from, uh, from weird religious cults. Anyway, so um, there was, the, the point is that there's tension in these early traditions and these new religions are causing religious consternation. And perhaps, in a way, perhaps dissimilar to the ways in which um, uh, contemporary new religions cause consternation um, in, in more conventional society. So it is not only the practices of the black blankets, but also the doctrines that challenge the Veda that Jayanta is concerned about. And arguing against the materialists, for example, he urges that um, alliance between his own Mimamsa tradition and Orthodox Shaivism uh, of the Shaiva Siddhanta could defeat these materialist groups in debate. So with Jayanta, uh, with Bhatta Jayanta's generation and during the time of Shankara Varman, we therefore have a period of rapid social change in which new forms of religion are developing that confront orthodox doctrines and cultural values. These texts, especially the more extreme antinomian ones, dispute the orthodox understanding of the good society being regulated by Brahminical rules of caste and stage of life challenge traditional ethics, especially sexual ethics, and challenge attitudes towards gender, questioning the implicit relegation of women to a lower status, along with children, low caste, and the mentally ill. The picture is, however, more complex in that tantras of the Shaiva Siddhanta adhere to the orthodox view of women and low castes. But a case can be made that these texts are emerging initially from groups of esoteric practitioners seeking power and salvation that were conceivably composed by members of lower caste groups and that they represent an eruption at the level of discourse into mainstream culture giving voice to those who were on the margins of the social order including women. Well here's an example of um, the nature tantra written on um, palm leaf manuscript dated 1200 AD. Um, so we can read these texts as a sign of change. So that apart from plays such as Giant Butter, a second source for support for the thesis that these texts represent a non-Brahminical incursion into the discourse is from the tantric texts themselves, with middle ground tantras such as the nature tantra, as well as purely shakta tantras such as the, the related Natragyana Narava tantra, and the transgressive texts such as the Brahma Yamala. With the nature, we find much shakta material about magical practices that were part of the wider popular tradition, as well as concerns with possession and exorcism. It is especially the latter that provides evidence for such a thesis. The nature has a few chapters concerned with this matter, classifying types of creatures that possess people, the symptoms of possession, and how to become rid of them. We can also draw on another text from Kerala that, is, that has similar chapter concerned with possession and it indicates the pan Indic nature of this new religion, the Ishana Shiva Guru Deva Palati. While everyone, including the Brahmins and kings, were prone to possession, demons could enter a person if they were in a vulnerable state, not having sufficiently protected themselves through ritual. If a polluted person's shadow was cast over them, for example, um, and it seems to have been those in the lower 
levels of the social hierarchy who are most vulnerable. Some chapters of the nature are particularly interesting in so far as they are signs of popular religious practice and indicate an expression of lower social groups. These texts are in the form of a conversation between Shiva and the goddess, generally the latter asking questions of the former. So the nature tantra that became popular in Kashmir from the 8th or 9th century is a dialogue between Shiva and the Lord of Immortality, as the Lord of Immortality, Atesha, and his consort, Amriteshvari. She opens the dialogue with a question about the eye of Shiva. This is his third eye in the forehead, which he burned desire will appear before him, a ray of fire emerging from it, showing his transcendence of desire. This eye is also linked to the nectar of immortality contained within or at the top of a person's head. The purpose of the text is therefore to raise, to praise the eye of Shiva and to offer a description of how it can be used in its manifestation in a mantra. All people, the text says, the text says highlighting women, children, or even men are prone to possession, including kings, their wives and sons, but especially people who dishonor mother and father and indulge in lust, drunkenness and gluttony. Shiva had created these creatures, these supernatural creatures, to help the gods defeat another group of anti-gods called Daityas, but now they are troublesome for human communities. And so he calls millions of mantras, divine beings from the pure realm of embodied, embodied as sound, to descend to the earth to defeat them. So let us take two groups of people generally oppressed within the patriarchal Brahminical culture, namely women and low castes. Women in particular are prone to possession if they are behaving in an improper way due to bad character, hatred of parents or infidelity and girls who have begun their courses. Children are also prone if they wake up crying at night and vulnerable people such as those who are mad, howling, shrieking and with loose hair. So I'm, I'm citing the text here. Possession also affects people in a state of impurity through contact with lower castes and who have come into contact with impurity, such as a corpse. This vulnerability to possession can spread through a kind of contamination. If an, person, if an impure person's shadow falls on someone respectable or on children, this can cause the evil eye to descend upon them. Those of lower social standing, the lower castes, who perform impure tasks are prone to possession too. A text composed in Kerala that I cited earlier, the Shanishvit Shiva Guru Deva Palati records possession by fierce and gentle beings who attack vulnerable people, such as people on their own at night, who have lost their wealth, those intoxicated with love, and those who wish to die. They attack women who have bathed after menstruation, naked, filled with passion, intoxicated, pregnant, and prostitutes. These beings also attack different caste groups, and notably lower caste pretending to be higher caste. Protection and exorcism, the appeasement of these beings, can be performed through ritual procedures that the nature tantra describes in some detail. The practitioner should protect his own family in this way, along with the king and family. Rites are also prescribed for the king who performs in order to ward off famine and natural disasters so that the, king will prosper, so that the kingdom will prosper, poverty will be destroyed, and even mundane illnesses such as boils and eye injuries will be cured. All this is through the power of the eye mantra. We might even see these practices are an attempt to create a kind of immunity in the social body against incursions by other forces. In sociological terms, we might say that the Brahmanical, the Brahminical social body absorbs alien practices and ideas as, and as though absorbing those practices 
and through absorbing those practices creates a kind of social immunity uh, which prevents the total destruction of the collective body. There are, there are also practices and, and the theme of sacrifice present, although um, which both acts as a trope and a metaphor. Chapter 22 of the Nature Tantra talks about supernatural goddesses called yoginis who, while they terrorize people, do so for their own good. They practice human sacrifice, the sacrifice of pashus, but this apparent violence towards bound beings is in reality for their benefit because when people are sacrificed by the yoginis, they attain liberation. So uh, we need to read these texts with sensitivity to the social reality to which they point. Here we see a concern with maintaining good behavior, namely conforming to social and gendered roles in which social power is maintained, but they also point to a challenge to that power and emerge as and the emergence of discourse here about possession from a lower from lower social groups into the mainstream. Indeed, so much so that supernatural protection was imperative for the king, not only to protect him and the family, but to ensure victory and prosperity. Whether the emergence of these traditions represents a revolutionary force is a moot point. That these traditions quickly became absorbed into the mainstream and adapted by the ruling elites suggests not. But the emergence of tantric religion into the mainstream does bear witness to social movements uh, at a grassroots social level that have impact upon higher social echelons. We know little about the macroeconomy of the region during the medieval period. Burton Stein has referred to medieval Hindu kingdoms as embedded hierarchies in which lesser kings pay ritual homage to overarching rulers who extended symbolic tribute as well as taxation to these other kingdoms, in contrast to the centralized empire that we find in Europe. Davidson speaks of the feudalization of divinity during this period in which deities are perceived as kings and warlords and conversely kings are regarded as divine. These tantric kings took initiation from tantric masters as we find evidence for from Nepal. And Vijayanagara, for example, what seems to have begun as ascetic and ritual practices to seek power and final salvation among particular groups, as we find in the earliest tantras, um, reaches its final, uh, sorry, um, yeah, um, Sorry, I've lost myself here. We have what began as a ascetic and ritual traditions become absorbed into the mainstream. And so what the point I'm trying to make is that um, a lower caste, lower, uh, lower social hierarchy discourse comes to it, com becomes, um, erupts into the, into the mainstream Brahmanical discourse and becomes absorbed um, by that discourse. Given that there, that there was relatively rapid religious change in the medieval period with the, with the tantric traditions, a number of questions present themselves. First, how do we account for such innovation in the particular con uh, context of its occurrence? Second, can we infer general principles about rapid religious change that can be applied more widely? And third, can we understand the particular situation of the emergence of Shakta traditions in terms of larger historic forces. Responses to such questions touch upon the problems of reductionism and what counts as explanation. What are the drivers of religious uh, change? And perhaps more precisely, what are the constraints that we need to specify that control the particularity of the emergence of the chapter traditions into its outcome? These questions are inextricably intertwined. In terms of the specification of constraints, I'll limit my comments to two realms that I think uh, we need to put in place in terms of explaining Shakta tantric religious innovation. The issue of how um, particular traditions in Kashmir in the early medieval period can be understood 
in terms of larger historical forces is important because the change that we witness there might form part of a network of wider social and political transformations. It is, of course, difficult to establish causal relationships, but it is possible that wider cultural constraints are operative during this period that control the outcome that is Shakta religion. A wider network of trade and communication that spreads throughout South Asia, possibly beyond, has impact, even though indirect, upon these religions. Kashmir functioned within a feudal economy that in the medieval period produced a surplus that allowed support for religious groups and monastic institutions, as Sanderson has argued in his article on Kashmir. In terms of world systems theory, Kashmir falls within what Wallerstein has called the West Indic sphere, the West Indian sphere, whose macroeconomy, characterized by trade routes, provided a surplus that in turn permitted the development of these traditions. Certainly the subcontinent was part of a world trade system open to cultural influences of a Gandhara in the Northwest that itself can be described as an Indo-Greek kingdom. Those remarkably quick spread of texts and people across the subcontinent, for example, the parents of the famous Shaiva philosopher, Avinavagupta, he tells us, came from Bengal. And texts composed in Kashmir made their way to the far south quite quickly. And here we can speak of Shaivism and probably of Shaktism too as pan-Indic religion on cultural forces during this medieval period with, um, uh, and cultural forces within this period with rites being adopted in Tamil Nadu whose origins uh, in Kash are in Kashmir as, as Samson shows. And also we get sharp to religions developing in Karnataka which find their way up to Kashmir. Uh, but to specify the ways in which economic growth affects culture in medieval India would be a detailed study that has not, to my knowledge, been undertaken. Although Sanderson does go some way to doing this, detailing the importance of irrigation systems and the new settlements in the development of Shaivism, for example. However, I would not wish to reduce religious innovation simply to the product of economic surplus. But economic change is probably a necessary condition that allowed religious innovation, such as we find within the Shakta traditions. Arguably, it is the appeal and force of the new Shakta religions themselves emerging as the voice of groups who had officially, uh, who had been socially disadvantaged, beginning to find voice, and in a sense, pushing into public discourse that is relevant too. Indeed, the Shakta traditions in particular were themselves written in a lower register language to the learned Sanskrit of the philosophers and poets that they called Aisha or divine, which indicates they're being composed by people who were not au fait with the higher learned register. With these texts, we are dealing with a pre-philosophical level of discourse in the sense that they articulate a worldview and provide material for, a systematic, for systematic argument of the philosophers, but are not themselves arguments, and they contain diverse, although related, um, models of what a person is. So um, time's rolling on, and I think I'll uh, come to a, a conclusion. Um, the, uh, my slideshow didn't quite match what I was uh, trying to say. The, these were examples of the absorption into the mainstream of these uh, Shakta traditions. Um, and I wanted to say that they, they challenge orthodox norms um, uh, and that there's this new innovation with the Shakta traditions. Uh, that it's not enough to look simply at the macroeconomic constraints upon these new religions, but we need to look at theological constraints as well within the traditions. And that the novelty of the worldview in these texts exceeds their political or socially sanctioned uh, dimension. So by way of uh, conclusion, because there is 
yet so much to be done in terms of relating religion to wider social, political and economic factors in the history of Indic religions. There is, there is no um, Ferdinand Brodel as yet of a medieval Indic civilization. Our assertions will always be provisional, but it does seem to be the case that the tantric Shakta religions develop relatively quickly. And I've here tried to describe how some indicators of that change from Jayanta's play and tantric texts themselves um, illustrate this rapid rise. We might put forward a thesis, therefore, that the origins of Shakta traditions are marginal to mainstream social and political order, focused on practices for developing supernatural power and final liberation. And that concerns about exorcism and possession um, are dominant in these texts. But that this new form of religion begins to penetrate and influence mainstream society. The heroic Shaktism identified by Bihani Sarkar, so much, um, so much so that Shakta traditions influence Indic civilization from Kashmir to the Khmer kingdoms of Cambodia. I have suggested that while the wider socio-political and economic order is important, this is insufficient in itself to explain this rapid growth, and we must look to internal or theological constraints of the religion itself. What begins on the margins of the social order becomes adapted, becomes appropriated by that order, and arguably thereby contained. Any threat to the social order is adapted to the advantage of that order. There's a kind of immunity system developed within this worldview. The Shaktism that appeared as a threat to Brahminical orthodoxy becomes absorbed within the social order, albeit at a lower level than that perceived uh, than that perceived by, uh, by the orthodoxy, than that perceived that the orthodox understood themselves as. This tradition reaches its acme around the 13th century, after which time there are significant political changes, such as the rise of the Delhi Sultanate and the introduction of Islam on a larger scale. After this time, the Shaiva and Shakta traditions lose their political power uh, and become purely esoteric and marginal traditions. And they remained marginal throughout the period of the modern world. So the rapid rise of Shakta tradition and its in incorporation into mainstream um, political world and, and mainstream social organization is accompanied by its rapid decline is a, as a major force in Indic civilization with the removal of its political power base. So once the political power base of the Charter religion is removed, then it becomes uh, purely esoteric uh, and declines in its influence, in its wider social influence, with the exception of Nepal. Uh, and, it become, and it shifts into a purely esoteric tradition. And once denuded of its political force, it becomes denuded of, of theological relevance. Uh, and now it's reduced to internet ads for rebalancing one's chakras. So I think I'll uh, end there. Thank you for your uh, attention. Um, my apologies if the lecture didn't quite correspond to the slideshow, but I hope you could make some sense of it.